Okay, we are live once more. Um, today we are going to discuss uh, the the f biggest future trends and how businesses and individuals can get ready for this. And I'm very excited to say I'm here with Lars Tweeder, who is a an author, an entrepreneur, a futurist. Um, you also manage a hedge fund, so maybe you can share a little bit um, what what you do and and how you ended up looking at at future trends yeah so um i would say the last 30 years that's how old i am but the last 30 years i've been working with um companies where we always had to look into the future so i have been founding or co-founding i think it's around 15 companies now um and uh, including a, a venture capital fund where of course you you need to be really sharp on, on what's moving mm -hmm. and just about to start a hedge fund um and i also have a group of companies under the umbrella called super trends inspired by a book that i have written twice <laughs> i wrote a book called super trends in 2009 which, which then, i, I which I really enjoyed, I have to say. I, yeah, this a, is a new one, though. The, uh, yes. so the first one had a, a, a very different angle, but this is a new one, so, yeah. Yeah, no, this this came out in 2019, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, so what happened when was uh, when in 2009, first time I wrote a book called Super Trends, I wanted to uh, promote it online, and then I thought, I'll make a list of 100 things that will happen before 2050. And the book was quite fat bigger than bigger than this one actually and i was flipping through it just you know easily to find a hundred things and it was amazingly difficult for me to to find a hundred specific predictions that i could say would happen between 2050 not i mean the problem was not you know predicting when stuff would happen i simply didn't have enough specific uh, events and then I thought, okay, so I'm, I'm writing about the meta phenomena that are taking place, but I don't have a map. It's like um, you sail out to sea uh, without a map, and all you have is kind of hearsay, and, and, and you know, somebody says, I, I, there's an island in that direction, there's a reef in that direction. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I hear it's generally bad weather there and so on. So I thought to be a really efficient investor, and also to be a really successful entrepreneur and business planner, you would like to have the best possible map you can of, of everything that happens in the future. So I bought uh, the domain uh, supertrends.com from an evil squatter who <laughs> charged me a lot. <laughs> and then I, I uh, had this idea to make a map where you um, get descriptions of, of future uh, events that are important and then crowdsource uh, opinions about when they will happen hmm. and at that time I mentioned that to many people and there was you know nobody really responded and so on but then when we started a, a venture capital fund I, I started thinking about it again and um, and then I founded the company and now it's really the super trends uh, group of companies so it's just the super trends ventures where we have made companies that uh, work with how to see, understand, and address the future with technology. So data driven all the way through. Um, and so I, so we're actually launching it um, the next two months with I think five clients. So five corporate clients, uh, one financial clients with about two thousand end users, uh, some companies in the fashion industry, a consulting company, and so on. Uh, so, um, if I can share screen, I can just show a little bit, like two minutes of what it is we do. So, just so yeah, ab people. absolutely. Let me do this in a minute. I just want to say a quick hello to a few people joining in. Um, let me just pull a few in. Christine is saying from hello from the French Alps. I think it's not far from where are you joining us today, Lars? I am in the Swiss Alps, and there's lots of snow. Lovely. I'm very jealous. <laughs> um, and we have someone from Romania, from India, from Pakistan, from Bali, um, oh. Edgar from the Philippines, Hussein from Iran, um, Kenya from Italy, Arai from the Netherlands. We have Carlos from Uruguay. So it's uh, Collins from Kenya. 
So it's a, a truly global audience as always. Um, I've got someone from Senegal, from Mali, from Indonesia. Nice. Uh, and anyone joining us more from Denmark, the country where you're originally from, Lars? <laughs> um, <laughs> I wouldn't. From Peru, I from Dubai, from Germany, um, mm. Toronto, US. Great. It's lovely to see you all on the stream. Um, as I said, these 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 sessions are always for everyone listening. So if you have any specific questions about future trends, how to prepare for them, what what some of them mean in practice, feel free to engage with us, and we will try to answer yeah. as many questions as possible. Um, so let me pull your slides up, and then you can um, take us through some of those those points, Lars. Yeah, this is so. One of the things that we do is that we have what we call Super Trends Lab, and that that is a software that goes uh, on online and uh, uh, researches everything you can think about uh, concerning some theme. So here I have a, a, an example where we, I was quite interested in fuel cells. So that's because I'm invested in platinum. You need platinum for fuel cells. So I. I wanted to know, you know, how is that trending and uh, compared to hybrid electric vehicles and to battery electric, etc., and to plug in uh, hybrid vehicles. So we, we go out on the net and then we get these hype indicators that show how much is going on within each of these subjects. So I can see if, if one of them is uh, accelerating. So here we, uh, we click on fuel cells and then you get this word cloud and shows what people are talking about within this uh, area, uh, which companies are there, uh, also the top 100 sites, um, the, the most important stories. And then on the most important stories, we use AI that uh, write very short summaries automatically. And then we check them and then we send them out in an app that I'll show you in a minute. So here we have, for instance, tweets over time. There's more than 100,000 tweets on fuel cells within one year, so nobody can read that. So with this software, we find out what is most important. So uh, that that is the labs part, and uh, it's a very, very good, uh, good way to get just like a dashboard with an overview of what is going on. And here are the aggregate super trends indices that show the interest in the four different technologies. Interestingly, they are kind of at the same level right now, but that will probably change. So then that goes into um, smartphone uh, as input to some of the stories we have. And on the smartphone, we have the app that goes, that has mapped all human innovation going all the way back to 3.3 million years ago when the first stone tools were, were made. And now here I'm surfing to 1712, 1744. So every little dot is an innovation. And now I'm going into the future. Of course, that's the most interesting part. So in 2022, we have a lot of, of uh, predicted events predicted by people who are experts in these areas. So we have a science team that interview experts and they upload events. We make sure they don't overlap, etc. Uh, now we surf to 2026. We see some other events. Um, and I click on one of the events. And uh, this is one that's interesting for me. It's the first rate hike in the US because I'm a finance guy, among other things. I go in and then I rate personally what, how important it is, how big the impact on business and society is. And that becomes a part of crowdsourcing because everybody can do that. And everybody also can bookmark, etc. So we can see uh, from all the free users on the free app that we are going to launch, we'll be able to see what, where the interest is and then also where people predict that things will happen. There's a news page where you get all this news. So some of it is written by AI, some of it by our science editors. And then you, you indicate if you think it's interesting, it's not interesting, and you can go in. So here's one I made a prediction on. So uh, I, can, I make a prediction and then I can see how my prediction is different from the consensus. And by being active with the app, I create an interest profile. So economy and finance, AI, etc. So this shows some of the things that I am following most. So this is a live. And then you will be able to publish uh, your own personal predictions on social media and also your interest profile. So it's, it's a tool for crowdsourcing what goes on 
uh, what people think is interesting and crowdsourcing a timeline. So we do uh, the crowdsourcing in two ways. We ask the experts who actually work with these specific fields, like if we take culture of meat, we have one section where we only ask people who work with culture of meat when they think the different events in culture of meat happen. And then we ask everybody uh, out there in the world when they think. So we get actually two different timelines. And right now we have no idea how much these timelines will differ. But I think, uh, have you read the book uh, called Super Forecasting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Super Forecasting, that was came out of a project at DARPA. Maybe, I, I don't know if, if I should talk about it or you should, but, but um, there they found that non-experts, the crowd of non-experts were better at predicting than the experts. Our suspicion in what we work with here is that it will be opposite because um, the, in, in the super forecasting, they were predicting common events like uh, riots, revolutions, uh, military coups, and so on, which uh, normal people could have an idea on. But we don't think that normal uh, people have uh, much idea about you know fusion power and stuff like that. But time will tell, and it will be very interesting to see when we go live. So Christine this, is just asking here, what's what's the name of the tool? Uh, Super Trends. So we have um, a website called supertrends.com. And there are no products yet because we are launching the products uh, within a month, uh, primarily white label for, for our corporate clients, but then we'll also come up with a free app. Um, so, and the website will doesn't really reflect all we have yet, but it will within a few weeks. Um, and the book, um, well, you did mention the book yes. is called the same super trends. So super trends, super trends. Very then, good. So when you look at some of the the key trends and some of the trends that obviously this this book was written in 2019, um, yeah. 2020, our world changed completely. What would you say are some of the the biggest trends the biggest macro trends that that you are watching very closely at the moment or everyone should be watching closely yeah i think we, if we go to you know complete helicopter view if not space view of, of what goes on some of the things that i find uh, most important is that um, we have commenced uh, it already began in the 1980s what you call a dematerialization of our economy and that means there's a decoupling between the growth of GDP per capita and the growth of GDP and the use of resources. Um, you see that, for instance, in the US where you have the, the energy consumption has it's not been entirely flat, but it's been pretty close to flat while the, the income levels and the population levels have continued to rise. Uh, consumption of many other resources per capita and in total have started to uh, decline. Uh, deforestation has stopped. Actually, we are we have a little bit net net. We have a little bit reforestation or rewilding now. So um, I think this will accelerate, and that we will get abundance. And that means there's um, there's a fear that has been. It was very very much when I was young that we should run out of resources. People don't talk so much about it anymore, but I, I still hear it. I don't think we ever run out of resources. I think we are, through innovation, uh, rapidly uh, approaching a point where we will have abundance like we won't believe it. There's actually um, a, something called an abundance index, which is a calculation of a, a basket of the 50 most used uh, commodities in the world. And um, the price of that continues to fall when you deflate it. So when you compare to overall inflation and the time price, which is how, how many hours the average citizen in the world needs to work in order to buy that basket of 50 commodities, uh, uh, falls to half every 20 or 18 years. So it's like a most low of <laughs> abundance that we have here. It's uh, so, because most uh, most people, lots of people, argue that actually we're seeing a resource scarcity. That the fight for resources like clean water and and other things will will increase in the future. So you don't see that. Yeah, I, I think you know if you go back to the sixties and seventies, uh, people were much more concerned about it. That's where people thought there would be global famine, etc. 
uh, but you still hear it, yes, and it's just, it's not been borne out by the statistical uh, facts, for instance. Uh, the global farmland uh, rose from year 1900 to 1980, it rose 30%. And that, of course, that was a problem because when the farmland grow, uh, it means that we are cutting down forest and destroying natural habitat. But since 1980, it's been pretty much unchanged. Uh, even though the global population has doubled and the average uh, nutrition or calorie intake has risen uh, considerably to, during that time. So we have doubled the output per unit of farmland. And now, and this is a good example actually, now we have these uh, technologies that are emerging that we can see on the Super Trends timeline. You have um, so plant-based uh, replacement meat. You have cultured meat where you grow meat cells in, in stainless steel tanks. And you have vertical farming. And if you take cultured meat, if we imagine that all, uh, all meat production in the U.S. would switch from farmed meat to cultured meat, then you would free up land areas equal to, I think it's five or six times the area of Germany. And if you took, uh, if all of the whole world did this, you would free up farmland equal to the size of Russia. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, what we are looking into, I think, is that we had plateau in farmland starting in 1980s, it's been flat uh, since. Within a few decades, it will start dropping dramatically, and we can release a lot of land for natural national parks, etc. Another example is within energy, where um, if you go back in time, and I, I actually did a TED talk about this, um, you, if you go back to the U.S. government predictions of when the U.S. would run out, out of oil. Um, in the 1908, 1909, they thought they were running out of oil. And in 19, uh, around 1920, they thought there were 60 billion uh, barrels of oil in the world left because a lot had been burned, 60 billion. Then you, if you go to, to 1970, their estimate was that there was, and, and you, know, you, you burn, you keep burning oil, but in 1970, they estimated there were 580 billion barrels left. And you go to today, I mean, they, they think there's uh, way more than uh, a thousand billion barrels uh, left. Uh, so you actually, you can draw a smooth curve that shows, and, and uh, no, it's not smooth, it's exponential, that shows how they exponentially increased the estimate of how much oil that was left, even though we were burning all the oil, oil we could find all the time. Uh, but meanwhile, we, we changed to new technologies. So we have solar and wind, of course, but it also looks like we will have some radical new technologies uh, coming up. Uh, for me, uh, the, the most interesting at all is nuclear fusion, where you fuse deuterium and tritium. Um, so um, people have said for what for 60 years that nuclear fusion is, is 40 years away and will always be 40 years away. But if we look at the, the consensus estimates on our timeline right now, it is that it's they say that we'll have sustainable fusion in an experimental reactor in 2025 now that's four years from now that doesn't mean that we will have uh, electricity generated by such uh, reactors in our grid because then you have to start uh, fusion reactors that are easy to maintain and so on that might take 15 20 years but it's happening and and it's, it's interesting to see that many things that you predicted um on the timeline have been moving and so we are we have an automatic alert generator that alerts people when stuff starts to moving radically on the timeline um so uh what it looks like to me now is that we by the end of this century will have um at least probably a 90 percent hydrogen economy Hydrogen, because deuterium and tritium are actually isotopes of uh, hydrogen, but also uh, hydrogen because hydrogen is a nice fuel. Um, and you're beginning to, here in Switzerland, you can, there are now fuel stations for trucks with hydrogen. There are quite a lot in Germany also. The EU is making a big drive uh, for hydrogen. Um, and there will, of course, also other technologies. But I think we're, hydrogen would, play a very important role and uh, it's like limited, limitless. 
so if you if you you and I should get our uh, lifetime consumption of energy from nuclear fusion, the amount of deuterium and tritium we would need personally is really small. So we would need uh, lithium that you can contain in, in two notebook batteries. That lithium then has to be converted to tritium. And then the deuterium that is contained in one bathtub of, of tap water. And so if you, if you make these calculations, it turns out that we probably have enough to power uh, the world for billions of years with this. And there's no waste. The waste is helium, which is the most common thing in the world, in the universe, actually. So, uh, and you use it to blow up balloons for children's parties. So, so that's a very long answer to, to, uh, to your question about the, the main themes. And there was only one theme. And that yeah, was. Sure. So, I, 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 th I think you, you cover two, two. There's this increasing abundance. So, it, mm. we, we're not really facing a scarcity of resources. And then, I guess, with energy, you also touched on sustainability. And that was interesting when I read the book, super, your book, Super Trends, that you said actually you are less worried about the um, about climate change and the economy even though this is a, a big problem at the moment you feel that we have the technology and the skills um on the horizon at least to change this and i get i guess fuel cells and and hydrogen energy that, that they are examples of this right yeah, so uh, I think always when you discuss these kind of matters, you have to distinguish between the normative and descriptive. So normative what is what you would like to see, and the descriptive is what is likely to happen. And sometimes people mix that up a bit. But but I think that um, if if we take the normative, you have three kinds of environmentalists. You have what you call light green, which is People say, I personally want to you know, live responsibly, clean, and so on. And you can just say that uh, that's definitely good, but it can't really address the problems because as the, the wealth in the, in the world rises by, by about 2% a year and the population a bit over less than 1% a year. So uh, we need to do more than just uh, think responsibly. Then you have dark environmentalism, and that that is a movement where you say, oh, "It's it's so dangerous what we have got going. We have to uh, stop all economic growth and uh, and plan for a, 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 a future where we have to live much more humble." And then we have bright uh, environmentalism where you say, "No, no, actually, we need to have more wealth uh, because if, first of all, if we look at uh, in, environmental performance index, which is calculated uh, by number of universities, et cetera. There's a very clear correlation between the GDP per capita and how how high your performance is on uh, environments. And so in the top, for instance, you often had, had Switzerland, which is a super wealthy country, and the ones in the bottom are really poor countries. Uh, so the point is that you can address uh, both resource issues and pollution issues most efficiently through innovation. Uh, I am a great, great fan of uh, many science writers, but the, one of the ones who really blew me away is uh, David Deutsch. I don't know if you've read his book, The Beginning of Infinity. It's like, it's, it's, it's an insane, insanely funny and interesting book. I mean, not funny like slapstick funny, but the way he sees things. Uh, but at one point, he writes that probably in the Stone Age, there would have been people who would uh, die of cold weather lying on some branches. And why did they do that? Because they had not invented uh, the technology of controlled fire. Okay, so here we are today, and we have not invented the technology of merging deuterium and tritium or making nuclear reactors with thorium. Um, but it's, it's possible. I mean, it doesn't defy the laws of physics. Uh, so it's almost certain, a certainty that we will, uh, just as it was probably a certainty that uh, Stone Age people would figure out how to control fire. Uh, so the point is that resources are, it's not like a bucket that we are emptying. Resources are the result of innovation. 
things that are not resources to us, like deuterium, tritium, uh, proton, uh, and many other things, become resources when we figure out how to how we can utilize them. And and typically, it becomes more and more elegant for every step we take in in our innovation. Uh, for instance, uh, the power per weight unit of deuterium and tritium in fusion is more than a million times bigger than in coal. So everything gets more compact. This is my smartphone, not very different from most other people's bodies. <laughs> we know the whole story about uh, it, if you go back 30 years, you would need a massive mainframe and cameras and typewriters and so on. You we'll probably fill a whole house with it. And somebody calculated would have cost $30 million and I got this phone cheaper. So, <clears throat> So we are dealing with it, and, and the way we should address these issues, in my opinion, is that we should invest more in science, and we should also uh, create an environment where innovation startups uh, is attractive, so we get more of it, because moving forward is the way, moving backwards is not the way. That's my opinion about those things. Very good. And I, I think my opinion is based on data. Yes. So the, the other trend when, when we talked about before, you talk about the three clouds as a as another big trend. Do you do you want to talk about this? Yeah, yeah it it's um a bit inspired by um very often people when people ask me to do a talk and then I say you can you talk about the future like digitalization, for instance. And I think yeah, I, I can do that, but digitalization is like what people have been talking about for 30 years. So um there's an uh, there's a, there's kind of parallel angle that i would like to address and that is that um just as you can divide media or information into bits and bytes you can also divide other things into very small discrete uh packages and so you have the cloud of the it cloud which we we're, we're using every day um which is smart because I can access on a super flexible basis. I can access computer power and storage power somewhere else out out in the in the cloud. I, I have no idea where it goes on actually. And um, then we have the human cloud, and this this came after the internet that um, you people started to work in the gig economy where they became freelancers, and then they offer their services uh, to many different people. For instance, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, um, I went on 99 Designs and made a design competition for a local. And there were, uh, anybody could, you know, come and make local suggestions. And I made it as an open uh, uh, competition so everybody could see all the other uh, inputs. And then I would rate them and everybody could see what I would rate. So in the beginning, they were going lots of different directions and then they started to converge in a few directions. Um, so if you ask one of these people who are all over the world, by the way, uh, who are you working for? That would not be the right question. The, the right question would be, what are you working on? So these people probably have 20, 50 different uh, competitions going at the same time, maybe also something else. And so what happens with the, the human clouds is that our that our services get divided into smaller uh, discrete objects. And then you get a marketplace for that. And in the marketplace, the ratings are very important. Like I rated every uh, suggestion and that gave feedback. Uh, you know, Uber, where you, you rate the driver, the driver rates you, fantastic. Uber also has a variable price and many of these marketplaces, but not 99 designs. At least I, I haven't seen that, but they, um, they also have uh, fluid uh, market prices. So the whole market for, the, you know, in the IT cloud and also in the human cloud, the whole market becomes much more fluent and much more efficient in a, a macroeconomic sense. And then the, I think that's the third cloud you, you can talk about, and that is the, the cloud of things. So I, IoT is really taking off now. And what made it take off is partly that, you know, all the sensors that we have in tablets and, and smartphones, of course, have become so cheap and so good because of, of the big market for these devices. But also that we um, we had a limitation in, 
in uh, uh, the Internet pro protocol that we uh, that was, is still dominant by version four, but the uh, IPv6 uh, has so many different addresses that you could actually, for every square millimeter of the surface of the Earth, connect quite a lot of devices. So the limitations are going away. And the last thing we needed was G5, which is, uh, can connect an order, almost incredible uh, number of devices in, uh, in a local environment. So with the cloud of things, you will have data coming from so many different places, all sorts of data. And the way we'll treat the data will typically will, will be with big data uh, approaches. So the main difference between big data and, and not big data is that traditional data, you would do a statistical sampling. You would do it at some point in time and you know, generate a report. But with, with big data, you normally use all the data. Uh, you are not uh, sampling at, at specific times, but it's going in real time. And you also use AI to extrapolate the data that is, is missing. A bit like the way our, our eyes work because we have a blind spot pretty close to the center of focus and we can't see it because our brain just uh, extrapolates and puts in what it guesses is is invisible to us. So so yeah, so we have this, this trio of technologies, IoT, big data and AI, which create the third cloud. Uh, but the overall sum of having these clouds is a far more efficient economy um, because uh, if you if I already addressed it with people and with co computers but if you look at the cloud of things um, the things can report when they need service um, so you can get service not too late but not too early either so uh, just just in time service um, they can order spare parts um, I have a friend who worked uh, a very big company called Bossa selling screws and nails. And uh, you know, they did come and deliver a box. There's a little weight sensor at the bottom of the of the box, in which you know they deliver to a factory. And when the weight comes down to a certain point, they also automatically send a replacement. So um it's it's a very, very uh, economically efficient trial of the clouds that we are rolling out right now. I'd say the IT cloud, of course, is mature, but the other ones are not. Very good. I just had a question here from Tim saying, do you feel that the concept of crowdfunding is the secret to unlocking more accelerated innovation? I, I, I certainly think that it plays a big role. Um, it's not the only thing. You have uh, incubators, accelerators, venture funds, uh, angel forums. Uh, but but this is this is uh, this is a great concept, and, and also it allows people to diversify. So the statistics for what happens to startups, as we all know, are not that encouraging because most startups go belly up uh, pretty soon, but a few of them do extremely well. So you instead of being invested in one or two, you would rather be invested in twenty. And uh, if you have limited means, it becomes much more feasible to do that if you use uh, the crowdfunding. Very good. We just had one of your fans coming in, I think. Mikael this is saying, from Hello, Denmark. Denmark. Lars is a business rock star here in, <laughs> in Denmark and very famous. Even my 18 year old son reads his book with great, with his books with great passion. So that's <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Why do I live in Switzerland then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um so the some of these big trends then what do they mean for individuals so how, how as an individual how do i prepare for this if, if there will be lots of people listening to this thinking okay that we see all these technology shifts towards digitalization cloud ai data we see some of the bigger macroeconomic trends um what what do individuals do? How do they prepare to succeed in in this new future? So, so I, I, I have one thing that I think is really important. That is very often when you hear about fantastic stuff, then everybody thinks they have to go in that direction. But it's not everything is for everybody. I think the first thing you should do is try to know yourself. Uh, and I'm a big fan of doing this uh, online personality tests. Uh, I've done like a, a lot myself, 
and I found that they are actually very accurate, at least the ones I've done, and find out which kind of person you are, and, and that will tell you which kind of job or job or work that you will thrive with. Um, so if, if you go into this world where there's where in the gig economy, um, where it's like you have to fight for every client, on the other hand, maybe you're fighting for so many projects that so there's no real risk of, of, of having nothing to do, but there's a risk perhaps of having less to do, uh, perhaps also more to do uh, from, uh, during some times. Uh, but <clears throat> but other people, they're actually much more happy in a, in a more fixed environment where they go to the work every day. Uh, some people cannot work alone because um, they get energy from being surrounded by a group of people in a room, except now in COVID. So I, I think that's the start. But, <clears throat> but I, uh, so a couple of things I, I would say is that I think that everybody should plan for a more wealthy world. Um, as I did say that GDP per capita rises about 2% a year, a bit less, but in, you know, with compound effect, it is about 20% every 10 years. Um, uh, in 100 years, the world, the average income per capita, you know, in real terms, would probably be six to seven times as high as it is now. I, I would assume that uh, places that are really poor in Africa at that time will have a, a standard of living which is equal to Germany today, if not a, a lot higher. Um, so there are many ways to plan for that. You know, invest in equities, keep investing in equities your whole life, um, uh, but also assume that um, that the that people will move up the Maslow pyramid of, of needs. Um, we see that here in Verbier, where, I, where I'm sitting right now, um, there are lots of local people who are mountain guides, ski guides, bar, bartenders, um, selling skis and so on. And you ask them what their parents do, did they were farmers, so they were producing food. So basic needs, very low in the, in the pyramid. Skiing is very high in the pyramid. Some of them are also doing yoga training and mindfulness and, and so on. So what happens is that technology is, it's far easier to use technology to automate what is at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so these jobs disappear, which, which is generally good because many of these jobs are quite repetitive. Uh, but then you get more and more jobs at the top of, of the pyramid. Now, I think uh, some people are concerned about structural unemployment, but there's something called Say's Law that says that um, supply creates its own demand. So even though that on average, humans are probably like two to 400 times as productive in, as in the Stone Age, we, we don't have 99 point something percent unemployment. No, we are pretty close to full employment in most economies. Um, and that is because we just keep uh, replacing one thing with another. So I, th I think that will continue to happen. And, and that means that in, when you consider um, where to work, where there will be jobs or, or jobs or gigs, <laughs> it's most likely to be at the high end of Maslow's uh, pyramid of, of needs. So that's worth considering. Mm. Um, yeah. Do, do, so you, you're not worried about artificial intelligence and, and robots <clears throat> taking taking all the jobs, which I, I agree with. I think there's that we'll have more jobs, we'll have different jobs, it will all transition to, to a, a, a new world. But you talk about gig, gig economy. So um, what do you think will be the balance of, will there be... 50% of people working in traditional employment and 50% in, in gig economy jobs? Or will we see a slow transition where everyone basically is a, a free agent that has a set of skills that they can then hire out to different organizations or different projects that need them? So what sort of balance do you see and, and how fast do you see this transition happening? I, I don't see that everything will become gig economy uh, for the reason that I mentioned earlier that some people prefer uh, a different environment. So it, it will find its new balance. It's a little bit like uh, some years ago, the book market, you, you, have, you have written what's 18 books, 
uh, written sensing. So I've, I've spoke, we've both spoken a lot with publishers, but I, I don't know if they talk with you about the catastrophic dis, uh, decline in the book readership some years ago. But the decline stopped, so it, it fell down to a lower level and then stabilized there, and it seems quite good now. So um, I think we'll it just reset to another level. But it was interesting with COVID that so many of us, including the two of us, not right now, uh, working from home. Mm -hmm. um, then I read studies about how many people in each economy actually can do their work from home. And in, in wealthy countries like UK and Switzerland, where we are, uh, US, Denmark, and so on, it's about 50% of the population who can work home from home. And a lot of us find that it's actually more productive. So I have become more productive during COVID than I was before because I don't feel any obligation to travel to meetings. We do it online and save a lot of time. Yeah, I um, have so many of these conversations now with people all over the world and everyone that is in a similar environment that, that we are in feels exactly the same. I feel mm -hmm. probably twice as product productive at the, at the moment in yeah. terms of mm -hmm. what, what I can achieve in a day. There's an interesting question here from Vivian saying, will urbanization be reversed in the near future? Um, it is, it, it is a very interesting uh, question and I'd like, I'd like to start with something that really surprised me because um, ev everywhere you read that, you know, urbanization is continuing at a, a blistering pace, but there was somebody who wrote that if you look at satellite photos, it's actually not true anymore. So I'm not quite sure about that. I don't know, Bernard, if you have seen anything about that. Um, of course, it, it, it depends how you define what is urban or suburban or yeah. that so, urban or whatever. It is but, very interesting. I think it's still too early to know, but I, I, I think in in I, I live in the UK, and what I'm seeing is that big city centers are, are much emptier now, obviously. But I also see that lots of the big companies are now selling real estate, rethinking what they will do. So in the past, everyone was drawn towards big cities like, like London, to, and ma mainly because everything revolved around work. That you'd go go mm. there. You, you work in the office, then you go to restaurants at lunchtime, afterwards you go for a drink and so on. So I, I think for me, the key is that organization, that, biz, that city centers actually rethink how they define themselves and especially mm -hmm. around more around a, a social and cultural uh, and draw to bring people in. And I, mm -hmm. I think urbanization, I think in the past was people move there because of work i think now they will work they will move to places where they get the, the best work-life balance where they get access to nature where they get access to good restaurants and theaters and and that will become much more important so i, I could imagine a shift towards other areas where people feel like hey, even though these these cities had the big companies in the past they were not the most attractive places to be and we will see a shift yeah, I, I have a comment. I, I actually write something about it in the Supertrans book. So transportation has historically meant a lot for urbanization. So it was the, the suburbs became possible because of the mass production of cars. Um, now with uh, electric cars and um, self-driven cars, well, well, electric cars are there now, but also with um, micromobility, you're freeing up a lot of, uh, so you'll have less cars driving around in the cities and you also free up a, a lot of the parking space. And that means that you can make more outdoor cafes, etc. And electric cars are more silent than the other cars, so it gets more silent there, it gets more clean, you get more cafes, uh, you get maybe discos in the former uh, parking houses or whatever they are, uh, some of them are converted into. So that speaks for the cities. So that's, it speaks from moving from the suburbs back to the cities. But then when cars become completely self-driven, so you can actually go in and sleep when it drives you back, that will again speak for the suburbs. We're not, but we are not there yet. But then when we get the, the quadcopters um, to the degree that uh, you, we get permitted to really <laughs> use them in, in, in big numbers, then you'll have this, you know, you can take off from the city in a quadcopter and then you can fly out so a summer house, which might be three hours drive away, but it's only one hour or 45 minutes in your quadcopter. And that will open up a market for these more remote um, vacation areas. 
so um, I think the the lifestyle we are drifting towards is that a lot of people uh, for lifestyle, uh, partly for lifestyle uh, reasons, would like to have a residence in the, in the cities, but they also would like to have a residence outside, closer to nature, and transportation will that make that more and more possible or feasible. Very good. And once all the, the farming goes, we'll have lots of space to <coughs> and recreation. Yeah. So, so, if we, so if we get a dramatic decline in the global farming areas during the rest of this century, which is, I think we both, we spoke a little bit about that earlier, um, so we get all these national parks. Um, one thing that I think will increase is hunting, uh, because <clears throat> we would be concerned with having uh, lots of, of predators that are really uh, dangerous for humans. So we still like ourselves to be at the top of the food chain. And so there will be a lot less farming, but there will be a lot more hunting. Uh, that's my guess. And maybe with all this land, you will have these uh, small uh, you know, place, places where you have huts and houses out in the nature and small areas. And then people will come in their quadcopters. That, that's kind of how I rem imagine um, that is going within the next 50 years or so. So, and and what does it mean for businesses? So we talked about individuals as a business. You, you obviously work with lots of other business leaders. You have you you you're running a number of businesses yourself, and and you see lots of businesses that that are successful, and maybe some of them that are not so successful in in getting ready and preparing for the, the, those shifts that we're we're seeing happening and. What I'm seeing is that that the innovations are speeding up, that change will only get faster in the future. So how do organizations put them in a position to be successful in this new world? What are some of your top tips to say, okay, if you are running in a, a business, what what do we need to do to 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 make sure we we succeed in this new world? Yeah, there are, there are a number of things you can do. Um, I actually make a list of 20 things in, in the book. Um, so you can you can delegate within your team. So um, try to decentralize your team. Um, about half a year ago, or it's, no, it's longer ago, but um, I visited a, an organization in Holland called Bursorg, and they do home care for elderly and ill people. And um, the, the, the people who started it, uh, or the person who started it, he came from the public uh, system, which was uh, very centralized, where they even had pin codes that they put on, on people's door, and then with a the phone, they would check in, and then some economists would measure who was fastest at, at doing what, and so on. So it was completely like industrialized and, and uh, very <laughs> not very human. And then uh, he he thought that was very bad. And then they made Bootsorg where uh, they have teams of maximum 10 people. And um, they there's, there's no control system at all. Everybody regulate themselves. Um, and they go out when first time they meet a patient, they, it's mandatory. They sit and have talk, uh, coffee and talk. And they talk with their relatives. They talk with their neighbors and so on. So Bootsorg is, is expanding at a blistering pace. Um, it's very successful in Holland. Um, the average cost of doing this uh, with Bootsorg is about 45% cheaper than when the state does it. Uh, the, the employees in Bootsorg, uh, which is now you know, it's a large organization, so they measure um, employee satisfaction in the in organizations with more than a thousand employees. Bootsorg employees are the most satisfied employees in Holland. And uh, the patients are more, far more happy with Bootsorg with, than with the state service. So this is an example of what you can achieve when you decentralize. And there are many uh, IT companies that are also very good at it, like Spotify has a, a very set concept for decentralizing, even they, you know, how they, they create uh, physical areas of a decentralization. Every team can release, uh, so they release something that is initially invisible to the clients to see if it creates any destabilization. So you do A, B, release, test it a little bit, nothing bad happens, and then they release the whole thing. So a decentralization is and empowering people in that way 
is very important. And I, I think that's some, something that we should all, always, always bear in mind that we have, I'll see if I can do this right, but you have three things that are important in, in decision making. So this, the insight in, in what goes on, it's power to decide, and then the consequences of what you decided. So if you have the little, the small house on the prairie, little family there, all isolated, these things are very, very close together. So if they made a mistake, they're not going to repeat it. Uh, but when you take the power to decide and remove it from the inside and remove it for the consequences, uh, as happens in, in centralization, you get a lot of bad effects. The decentralization is very important. Then I think to create a meta uh, organization where you work with people around uh, outside the formal organization is very important. When I did the local competition, I got three hundred more than three hundred suggestions for people I never met. So that's very very decentralized. But you can you can set up an accelerator uh, if you are a corporate, uh, um, an incubator, a venture fund, or or take you know set up a venture fund with some other companies so you get this flow deal flow and you see all the things that startups are working with and you invest in some of them you can systematically buy up uh, companies i have a daughter who started uh, business economics but she was an intern at hilton group and they did uh, dragon's den competitions which uh, where they had they awarded some money to the best ideas which was super motivating for everybody because they are listened to, and that means that they are all the all the time thinking about what can I come up with that makes this business better. Mm -hmm. You can do like uh, innovation prizes, like uh, X Prize. Um, uh, th those uh, one a great example was it's quite a quite a number of years ago, but IBM they had a number of core technologies because they were very good. They are very good at, at core science. Um, but they were not sure that they had figured out what these core technologies could use be used for. And then they made a huge innovation competition where they they invited employees, spouses of employees, university students, clients, etc., to come with proposals for application. And they got a completely overwhelming number of ideas, which they then narrowed down to uh, a, a smaller number. So many other things like that, an app store, uh, open API, etc. Everything where you can include other people. Also, what you do so well, I also do it. What you do, like at ten thousand better than me, is that you go on social media, talk about what you're interested in. Um, maybe just you see a story written by somebody else, you share it, you write, you write very briefly why why you find that interesting. You get feedback. Mm -hmm. So all the people, uh, you're in your case, like two million people, right? So you you have you have four million. Bernard Ma has four million eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you didn't use social media, you would have two of each. So these people, they're looking they're looking out in the world for things that are interesting to you, and they're feeding back to you, and you're feeding back to them, and and to to mobilize. Um, the whole world for what you're interested in that way is so efficient. Um, I, and yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's so vital to have those social networks that you listen to and engage with and have communications with. This is why we're doing these sessions to exactly do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. to listen to you, to listen to everyone listening here and, and hopefully listening to their, their comments and questions. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think businesses that do this well will will become more successful in the future and it is it, it, it goes back to something that is very very fundamental so i wrote a book um <laughs> this one was called the creative society and it, it the book is about how creativity actually appears in the system and so the specific system that it focused most on was uh, western europe because Creativity took off like a rocket in Western Europe around the year 1450. And I couldn't figure out why at first. And then I, uh, I, I saw uh, somebody actually via social media, somebody just sent me an animation of European borders going back um, since, you know, before the Roman Empire. And I just looked at that. It was loud music and you saw all these borders changing all the time in this animation. And then you saw the Roman Empire certainly collapses. And then 
Europe gets split into, at one point there was 5,000 different city-states in Europe. And then uh, it started to consolidate in big kingdoms again, many places, but you had this band that was Northern Italy, Switzerland, Germany, some of Eastern France, the Netherlands, Belgium, some of Northern Europe that remained incredibly decentralized for 500 years longer than the rest. And then I, I, I looked at that and I thought that pattern, I've seen that pattern somewhere. And the way I had seen that pattern, you know, of this decentralized place was actually two places I'd seen it. One is something called the blue banana. The blue banana is like it's drawn as a banana that covers exactly that area. And this, this is the most wealthy part of Europe. And it's also the part of Europe with the highest population density. But the other place I'd seen it was in a book written by Charles Murray, who's a social scientist in the US. And he had done a, a, an incredibly interesting um, uh, study. So he had 50 people, up to 50 people sitting for five years and reading 163 encyclopedias and writing down, you know, how, how much is written about every person that is mentioned. And then um, they said, uh, any person who has made some kind of accomplishment and who is mentioned in, in at least half of these encyclopedias must be a significant person. And then they mapped where did these people live when they did what is so important that it goes into all these encyclopedias. So 97% uh, of it was uh, that it covered 2,850 years until 1950. 97% was in, from Western civilization. But it turns out what it came, it came from Western Europe and the, the areas that had been populated by people migrating from Western Europe. But within Western Europe, half of it was in the blue banana, which is 0.2% of the world's land mass and like one or two percent of the world's population during that period. So, so I, I tried to, then I tried to overlap the maps of this uh, human accomplishment of, or innovation with the blue banana and with the city states. And I found out the decentralization with the city states must have been decisive because they overlap so well. I actually have some slides on it if, if we have time for it. But um, I think if you have a room, you come, you go, you go in, Bernard, you do a speech, you have a question and there's 200 people in the room. You want the people to come up with solutions to a problem. I think the most efficient way to do it is that you ask uh, people to divide into groups of two or three. So a lot of groups of two or three, then they sit independently, not talking with other ones. And then afterwards, they each come up with their solutions. So you will have maybe 30, 50 solutions. Um, and then everybody can see them, maybe everybody can rate, and then you say, okay, we do it again now. So now we divide into small groups again, but now you've seen what everybody did. You do that number of times, you will uh, have far better results than if the whole group had simultaneously tried to solve it. And this is what happens when you have city states, when you have meta organizations, when you crowdsource, etc. They said you send it out, many, many people uh, work independently on it. And it's what happened with 99 designs when I had my local mate. And there's even a theory that human species developed um, so uh, relatively rapidly because of a similar thing in climate. So what you had in Africa, you the climate would change between uh, that you had jungle and you had savanna, jungle, savanna, jungle, savanna. So the, the, the pre-humans were much better off in the jungle. In the savanna, there was not that much food and they were super visible to the predators. So whenever you had savanna, the population sizes shrunk to almost extinction. And then you got inbreeding. And we all know that inbreeding is mostly bad, but it does change. I mean, it is innovation. And then when the climate got better, you had all these different tribes then again co connected in the jungle. But then because of the inbreeding, they have become different. And then you would have uh, survival of, of the fittest. And then they were separated again. So it's like the rhythm that you want to do. That I did on 99 designs. Some people said this is the same phenomenon that created human through a very intense um, speciation because of climate change. 
Fascinating. Um, I have. There's a question here from Christine that just come in. Who who do you think, or which groups do you think are, are you worried about that that might be missing out um, based on some of the predictions around social and technological change and innovation that you've outlined? Um, any particular groups, uh, or, and are there any specific capabilities that that we would need? Any any areas and groups that that might be potentially vulnerable? I think people who would like to do a routine work that gets uh, can be replaced by AI or robots um, can easily be uh, left out. Hmm. Um, and there, there have been lots of studies, uh, I mean, lots and lots of studies of which groups will be replaced by that. But people who are not good at or, or interested in or lucky with changing to working up Maslow's the pyramid of needs uh, can get in trouble. By the way, I, I personally, I, now we, we move from <laughs> descriptive to the normative. Personally, I'm actually a fan of uh, basic income, but not because I think that we'll have systemic unemployment because of technology, but because I think that the, the elaborate welfare states that we have now uh, in many cases actually trap people in a victim position uh, where they get, they go on benefits and then they they don't have incentives to get out of the situation that they've gone, gotten into. So I think uh, a modest basic income where everything you do to, to better your own life uh, will actually benefit you, might be more efficient. I hope that will be tried out in, in large scale somewhere so we can see if, if that will work. Yeah, I think the universal basic income is is currently being being tested in in different places. I, yeah, I've yeah, seen a lot uh, with with some very good results and some very bad results. So we have a lot to learn. Mm. Very good. So th this hour has raced by. Um, what if if you leave us with some of your maybe your top three future predictions, top tips? Anyone listening from the business world worried about their, their their own world and their own career? What what are some of the the, the top tips that or some of the, the key points you would like people to remember or take away from today? In a changing world, so I I, I think I'll repeat some of the things I've already said that in a in a rapidly changing world, uh, test yourself, find out where which role you want to play. I think it's a universally very good advice. Uh, plan for abundance. Um, consider whether you want to be in the gig economy or in a fixed position. Um, uh, and also, if you are in the, in the gig economy, it means that you have no fixed work time, no fixed workplace, probably, no fixed pension age. Um, and uh, for instance, if you have small children, then you can work less during a period and then later you can work a lot more and, and so on. I personally completely thrive with having that flexibility, but it's something I think is very important for people to really think about quite mm. deeply. Great. I agree. Um, the where, where, first of all, thank you very much for 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 coming on 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 today. And thank you to everyone commenting engaging with us the the have, there have been so many lovely comments and questions as always let let me know let us know what you think about the session uh if you have any other questions that we haven't answered i'm very happy for you to put them in the chat and and we'll have a look afterwards um if anyone wants to connect with you lars or find out more where where can they do that the best is on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, you, you can have 30,000 friends and uh, I'm not you, so I don't have that. So I, I say, I, I, I accept everyone, except if, if there's something really dodgy. <laughs> so befriend me on LinkedIn. Very good. This is a, a great advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lars. Hopefully we will do this again at some point because the, the, we, we've, we could have carried on for another another three hours just talking about all these you, fascinating yeah. future trends. So I really appreciate your time today. Good. Take care, everybody. Bye.
and and anyone who's interested in re-listening, re-watching any of those episodes, they will all be available on my YouTube channel as well. So you can listen to all my previous conversations with other uh, fascinating people and and fascinating topics. And you can subscribe to my podcast. Um, that will we will turn all of these episodes into podcasts, ep post podcast episodes as well. So. We'll end here. Thank you very much. You all have a good day and I will hopefully see you soon. Thank you.